Welcome back, this is Collider's part three. In part three, we're going to be talking about the uh, Collider types, uh, a Collider event compatibility table, more on that in a moment, Collider efficiency, and uh, when and when not to use Colliders. Let's get going. So the first thing to note with Colliders is that there are multiple types of Colliders. What I mean by that, I'm talking about the uh, shape of the Collider, um, as opposed to the type field, which is on the Collider component. We'll go over that shortly. Uh, I have a, an example here in a world that's going to be published called uh, Collider Examples under my name in the tutorials category on the left of the world browser. And you'll be able to see all of these and go over them. So uh, here you'll see that we have the green, orange, and red categories. The green colliders here are what's known as procedural colliders. These are created using mathematics by Neos' engine, and they often have a procedural mesh to go along with them, which is why you can see them here arranged in green. This may not all be all of the procedural colliders, because there may be more by the time you're watching this video, but they are the common ones that you'll see. Procedural colliders are good, and they are marked as green for efficient, because they can be solved mathematically. I'm going to give an example of just the sphere collider. The others get more complicated, but the sphere one's kind of easy. A sphere is basically a point in space and a radius from that point. You can treat that radius as basically a distance, and so the sphere collider can detect whether you're inside it using a distance calculation. So the sphere's point where it exists is in the middle of that sphere, and its radius determines how big that sphere is. So right now I'm outside of the collider, but as my hand moves closer to the collider, it enters the collider's volume just purely by a sort of distance check here. That's how the sphere collider works. For the capsule, cylinder, cone, and box, it gets a little bit more complicated, so I won't go over those, but you can look into it. Um, colliders for other types, uh, sorry, collision volumes, for other types of colliders like these are well-defined online because they use common uh, algorithms. As these can be defined mathematically, they are okay, they're efficient, use them wherever you can. Uh, wherever possible, stick to sphere colliders, those are the most efficient, which you'll see a moment in that table over to the right there. The second type of colliders on this list are um, convex hole colliders. Convex hole colliders are a little odd and hard to explain, uh, as they're sort of more malleable and, and, and look weird depending on how you create them. Convex holes come up in... Um, First of all, you'll probably see them in the convex hole brushes. I've got an example of a brush here, which I'll leave in the world when I publish it. This is found in Essential Tools Brushes Rock Brushes. And you'll see here that I can kind of draw around and make um, rock shapes with this convex hole brush. A convex hole is basically just a convex object defined by a set of points uh, that exist in space. You'll see convex hole colliders uh, within sort of convex hole decomposition, comp decomposition, which I'll do a separate video on, and within... Uh, like world geometry, etc., where you can also do a uh, hole decomposition. Convex hole colliders are in the okay category because they're still generally okay to use, but if you can define everything by a procedural collider, go ahead and do it, it'll be slightly better. Like I said, I'll go over convex hole decomposition later. The last category is the red type, which is the uh, avoid if you can. I'm never going to say don't. Um, I've actually seen a rise within sort of near sessions where people are saying don't use that, it's bad, and I don't believe in that. Use whatever is appropriate for your scenario. You will know if there's a problem with the performance with it or someone else will tell you, but everything is is usable. Don't, don't feel you can't use it or anything or anything's off limits. Having said that, I do advise that you don't use mesh colliders wherever you can. As examples of mesh colliders here, I have a white blood cell here from uh, Neos Essentials, a sofa, a torus. Now, a torus is an example of a procedural mesh, but a procedural mesh which uses a mesh collider, so do take a look. Easiest way to tell is you can inspect a mesh, and if it's got the word mesh collider as a component on it, that it's using a mesh collider. And then the last example here is a mug. Why are these bad? The reason these are bad is because they can't be defined as mathematically securely as the rest of these colliders. To define a uh, collision event with a mesh collider, the engine has to basically check every single vertex and check if you're inside it, which can get very complicated. You might think it's simple for the torus, but that's actually kind of a mathematically complex shape. But it's even worse for this white blood cell up here, because it has to detect for each of these tendrils and each of the triangles and vertices on these tendrils, is my, is my finger inside them? Is my finger touching it, etc. To the right of this uh, list, we've got a BEPU v2 relative collision detection performance table. And uh, this shows you sort of the uh, cost and performance of these colliders. At the time of recording, NEOS uses BEPU v1, but the NEOS team are looking to upgrade to BEPU v2, so these will map sort of appropriately, um, and they're a good guide anyway. There are two processor architectures here, a 3770K and a 4790K, but you'll see that the performance is sort of the same except on the extreme right of the graph here. 
uh, a lower graph is better than a higher graph here. And I'll just give you an example from the left and right here. So you'll see here a collision event between a sphere and a sphere. Basically no cost. Take a look at it. Have fun. Those are quite efficient. Don't use too many of them, of course. Everything adds up to a whole picture of performance and optimizations. So don't use thousands of them, for example. But uh, one or two or however many you need is great. Again, nothing's off limits. Do what you want. It's Neos for, uh, you know, use what you need to use. Um, rendered on the graph here as we go across, you'll see the word triangle come up. Now triangle basically means a single try within a mesh. And that's why down here added by uh, ng is the phrase try equals mesh exponential. What it means by that is as you add more triangles to the collision, the uh, cost to calculate a collision event with it exponentially increases. As evidencing in here by ng's editing, less is better. So that's why you'll actually see that convex holes are actually at the end of this graph, and that's because it's a single convex hole rather than an exponential mesh. So when you adjust this scale for um, complex meshes such as the white blood cell up there, or maybe an avatar, or a level, or a gun, or something like that, they would actually be on the extreme right of this graph. It's just this graph deals with a single triangle colliding with a single triangle. Like I said, this graph will be available in this world, but you can also find it in exits and my public folder. Look out for it. It looks exactly like this in the thumbnail within the folder. I think it's in my tutorials folder. The last thing within this example world that's uh, theoretical is over here, which is our Collider Events Compatibility Table. Um, this table started out life as a horrible squiggly mess, which I was drawing with a pen. Um, exit here um, turned it into a UIX sort of uh, display. It's not really a table, but it's a display, uh, painstakingly adding the X's and, and, and uh, ticks where appropriate. I'll explain what this table means and how I use the test setup to the right here to validate it. So what you'll see along the top here is the four types of colliders. When I was scrolling through colliders in the um, inspector, you would have seen static, which is the default collider type, and trigger, which we used for the part two, which is actually over there in the distance. Um, but there's also two other types which are active and no collision. Uh, I'm going to explain what active colliders are first because we haven't really covered them. The reason we haven't covered them is they didn't come up in the tutorial content, but they will come up in subsequent issues and uh, more advanced use cases. Active colliders are called active because they basically actively check every single frame or update cycle if uh, they're colliding with anything. So if you imagine a sphere sitting within the world, every single update it's going, hey, am I colliding with anything? Hey, am I colliding with anything? Which can get very, very uh, performance heavy depending on the type of collision that you're using. Again, don't, ex don't avoid using them, but only use them if you really, really need to. So now that we know what active colliders are, uh, we can go through this table. Oh, no collision just means it doesn't collide with anything, hence why it's just a column of X's, but it's there for completeness sake. So on the top here, you can read this as the type of collider you're using, and then down the left here, you can read it as the type of collider you would like to collide with. So for example here, a static collider will not generate a collision event when it collides with another static collider, but a uh, trigger collider here will collide with an active collider or a user locomotion module. Locomotion modules have colliders on them, which is why in part two we were colliding with that box. We were in um, we were in walk mode, which allows us to collide with them. If you're in noclip, by the way, you won't collide with any colliders. That is intentional. It's because noclip means no collision effectively, so you don't collide with anything. Listed down on the left here in the vertical column, you'll see some other weird parts which take some explaining. So like I just said, user locomotion is a locomotion collider that exists in the physical locomotion only. Um, Mesh here refers to any type of uh, mesh collider. They don't usually generate any type of uh, collision unless you explicitly set the mesh collider to active. Setting a mesh collider to active is doubly as expensive as a mesh collider in general. Approximately, you know, not mathematically, just think about it adding up or to make a whole picture. Because what you've got is you've got a mesh, which is checking every triangle, every frame, if things colliding with it. So it's going through the whole triangle of the mesh going, yo, is anything colliding with the left elbow, the right elbow, the left hand, the right hand, and each triangle underneath that. So it's like super bad to use mesh active colliders. Don't, don't use them. Uh, if you do need to use them, please go ahead and do so. I'm not going to forbid you from using them, but please try and use other stuff before you get all the way down to mesh active. They're quite drastic. Uh, user body part refers to the uh, body parts. So for example, there is a collider in my hand here, which you can pick up on. Um, you can usually only pick up on that using an active collider though, because those are static colliders. You can see that if you just grab a developer tool tip, aim at your palm and just hit secondary, you'll get a collider there. And if you open the inspector, you'll see it's static. But you can collide with that if you're using an active collider and that's totally fine. You can do that one, like I said. 
The other one down here that was added recently in uh, version 0.0.2 is the user in anchor. Uh, someone was asking, hey, what happens when a user is in anchor? Are they registered as being on the ground or are they flying? From the looks of things, it matches if they are flying, except if you're using an active collider. Oh, with an active collider, you may be able to um, get some collisions when people are flying, uh, but again, don't rely on it too much. Uh, so if they're in an anchor, you can only really collide with an active collider. To validate this table, you can use the setup to the right here. I'll explain the setup and show you a few use cases of it. We have a static box, a trigger box, and an active box here. And you can actually drop any of these objects into the box to see what happens here. So, for example, here on the right active, we've got, um, it's currently set to green. What we do here is we take the collision start event, we get its slot, and then we write it to a slot variable, and then we get the slot name from that. If that's confusing, check out part two where we do basically that, but with a user's username. So here you'll see that it's uh, collided recently with an object called green. So if I grab the static red collider, I can drop that into the box and you'll see that changes to red. And if I change it back to green, I can drop the green box in. And this matches because we've got a static red collider colliding with an active collider. So that is a active collider colliding with a static collider and we've got a check there. So that's how that works. Try playing with all of these, they all work quite nicely. We've got a uh, trigger colliders here as well. Uh, that you can uh, play around with. This is another example of the uh, setup over there, which is just made a little bit more pretty with the logics to the right of it, so you can take a look at it. And there's another box example here with a trigger type of collider. The last thing to talk about is when to use colliders. Um, the answer that I've been repeating is basically whenever you need to. And do feel free to use any of these, even the red ones, whenever you need to. I am um, really want you to remember that Neos is sort of a free, fun place to create and uh, nothing is off limits. If you need it and you absolutely think you need it, go ahead and use it. An example where you might, for example, need an active collider, which I've heard of being frowned of in the past, it's absolutely fine if you use it right, is, um, for example, mining. So if you imagine sort of a, a field of, of ores or resources out in the world that you're mining with a pickaxe, I would make all of the ore like all of the ore pieces, the rocks in the ground, I'd make those static colliders, and I would put a sphere collider on the tip of the pickaxe, which is active. And that way, when they swing the pickaxe and they hit a rock, the active collider collides with a static collider, and we get a check, and we get an event there. And then we can pick that up and register them as mining it and give them some gold or some iron, whatever they're mining, etc. If you also make the active collider disabled when they're not holding the pickaxe, then the performance cost is basically only when they're holding the pickaxe. And relatively speaking, in any as well, that should be very little cases. You know, there are exponentially more rocks and resources in a world than there are uh, pickaxe in a world. Unless you're running a pickaxe factory, in which case you've probably got bigger problems. Um, I don't know why you'd run a pickaxe factory in, in, in Neos, but go ahead and go for it. That's really all I've got to go on this video. Uh, I do have some other videos planned, for example, uh, collision geometry in worlds. That's a little bit different because it's not collision events, it's uh, collision uh, with the locomotion systems, you know, jumping, falling, etc. Uh, and there's also some other components uh, that use colliders. I'll put some of them I've already recorded in the video description, but there are some more that I want to do. For example, Shifty sent me some awesome doors which work with the collider user tracker. Link to a video on collider user tracker below. I was using it for culling, but Shifty figured out how to use it for doors in a super cool way, so I want to go over that in a video for them. Uh, that's all you've got, really. If you've got any questions, do let me know. If you spotted a mistake, do let me know as well. This table took quite a long time to sort of validate, and there were a couple of times where I didn't believe my answer, so I was sort of poking boxes in and out of this setup, uh, you know, periodically for a period of a few hours. So uh, do let me know if you spot anything, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.